All right, so I'll start off with our first uh, question here. This is kind of a little bit of a softball. Hopefully this will be a fun one to answer. And, and by the way, I actually took uh, some inputs from the panel members on which questions they wanted to start off with. So they do have their preference in, in here. So the first one is, uh, what are your uh, biggest release or operations nightmare stories? Sort of what was the cause and you know, how did you recover from that? And we'll just start from you, Armin, and then go down. Uh, um, biggest nightmare is to actually uh, be shipping the wrong bits to the wrong users on the wrong platform. Um, another one is getting uh, your systems compromised and other people being able to introduce malware into your shipping product and you not knowing about that. So those are... And how did you recover from them or did you change your processes or did Have you make any, any other... any of that in the... No, we had... We have not hit it, but that would be terrifying. And a lot of our con a lot of our security analysis was around that, preventing that from happening. Oh, okay. So you've made some changes, and what what did the prompt? What kind of changes did that prompt? Um, locking down uh, our networks from the or the, even the rest of our, our our own organization. We are on our own separate VPN. Mm -hmm. um, having different si uh, sets of keys on the machines, depending on which type of jobs are going to run on those machines. So if, the, let's say, community members or people who are still gaining their trust uh, can still trigger some jobs in our systems, we have something called the try server. And on the try server, they can try their jobs. So separating our systems according to what will be run on those systems and minimizing who has access to those systems. Okay, okay, good answer. That's one of the ones that used to keep me awake at night. It's like if you make all this time and effort to make a really efficient delivery process, you know, if somebody manages to put something bad in there, you've just made the world's most efficient malware distribution system. Mm. And that's not the way you want to end your career, right? That's not a good right. move. <laughs> so um, uh, it's something we obsessed about. And there are companies around here that have been hit by that. And they've had to stand up and fess up and say, yeah, our build infrastructure was compromised and we're sorry for the last few releases. We think it's okay. But, you know, that that's really embarrassing to be in. So it's something we've fretted about. Mm -hmm. We've gone super ballistic. Anytime we find a machine that we're anyway suspect about and we lock it down and then find out it was a false alarm. So we've had a few false alarms. We've never had a real one. Right? Touch me. <sighs> um, my other different scenario is soon when I joined Mozilla, it hasn't happened to me yet at Hortonworks, soon after I joined Mozilla, one of our machines blew up. It turned out to be the only machine that did this critical task. And nobody knew how to recreate it, and there was no backup. And everyone was standing around me going, well, you're the bill guy. And I was like, sorry, it's all trees closed, no development, no ability to ship. So backups timely backups that you actually know the backups are working so try practicing the restore yeah you just reminded me actually of my worst nightmare i forgot had it been so bad i'd forgotten it so <laughs> I'm sitting with a v, sitting with a VP, um, and he's going, "What do you mean you don't know where the compiler is?" Um, to be able to reproduce code for uh, an SNMP fix that we needed to get out immediately. So the value of backups, we had them, but we had to go find them in some vault somewhere. Um, and so we did recover from that, and from that day forward, I always had systems that I could reproduce. Um, and this was from, not Google, but from a, a previous company where I had to go back and reproduce things five or six or seven years old on a regular, on a, on a regular basis because there's hackers out there that kept on trying to break, it, it was Cisco as a company, and trying to break that code uh, con on a constant basis. So that was, that was, that was Thank you, John, for that reminder. <laughs> never never want to do that one again. Um, the other one is actually sitting and watching after a release goes out and data corruption bugs happening uh, in this, again, at a previous company. So I've been at, at Google for only about eight, eight months. And so, and I did hear some of the horror stories of my peers, but I actually was asked not to repeat some of them. Uh, <laughs> but, um, you know, watching data corruption happen and having to go out and actually pull releases away so people wouldn't be downloading anymore so that they wouldn't be doing an upgrade that would be failing for them. Um, and what we found is we weren't testing well enough. We needed to go, we needed to really deep, do a deep dive on our testing and make sure that we were testing as our customers were. So that was a huge lesson learned. 
Um, mine is, uh, so we talk about uh, freedom, having a lot of freedom in terms of what you're putting into the product. Uh, military software, some of the people I was talking to, they, uh, they're developing one set of features and then all of a sudden they have you know, a general coming in and saying, this is the thing that we need in the next release and it has to, you know, go operational in Afghanistan. And you're like, what? <laughs> so uh, not having that much control over what features you're actually releasing can be pretty, uh, pretty terrifying. I'm a researcher, so I just want to ask another general question before this got finished up. Basically, what are the research, uh, research questions like researchers can do to help? I see a lot of, um, like, it's about risk management, it's about um, um, uh, cost drivers, and some of the things we do. But on your mind, what's the top one or two uh, things that over long term, I mean, research do research quite slowly. <laughs> Sometimes it's not like going to have a solution tomorrow. Um, but uh, looking forward, um, what what's, what's needs to be researched? Thank you. So also being a researcher, uh, <laughs> one of the things that, that I'm really interested in is this whole uh, rush to release process, which is, you know, if you have a year long release, um, it's going to take, you know, people are going to want to push their stuff into that release, whether it's ready or not. Whereas if you have a week long release, you can say, just get on the next train. Uh, one thing that we would, we're trying to do is actually quantify that. So intuitively, I think everyone agrees with that. But what we'd like to do is show, you know, the, the, the features that are rushed in, do they actually produce more customer reported defects? So actually tying changes that are, you know, that are done really quickly and pushed in very quickly, do those end up having more customer problems than the ones that are done in a more sort of the, the normal sort of stable way of pushing in new features? Um, I have a slightly different slant on the same one, which is, I think uh, if I could ask for anything with a magic wand, I'd ask for tools that would actually help us do our job. So specifically in my, when I think of recurring pain points, one is manually maintained build dependencies that are accurate at some point in history, but quickly become not, and then becomes everyone's recurring pain to try and figure out. So you end up overcompensating and doing like full clubber builds just to be sure, right? Because you don't trust the dependencies to be always be accurate. One, two is not knowing which test out of gazillions of hours of tests actually should be run for this code change. So you end up again overcompensating out of paranoia and run this whole set, or you, you try and hand pick something, but it's a scary process. Um, and that's because we don't have tools that would tell us, hey, this piece of code, I mean, some code coverage tools sort of help, but this piece of code really is being impact, you know, these tests would m check that. So yeah, something I, I, better than that would be great. A, a, absolutely, plus one, that's what, what I was gonna say. It's, 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 it's what it, uh, source to test is sometimes what it's called, or test minification. Um, and I know Google does it really well, but they've got a full structure with the build system to be able to know your dependencies. But that's not true for other companies. So that would be awesome to be able to figure out an awesome source to test, whatever you want to call it. But how do I know to run the right tests at the right time? One question I've been having for the longest time, I'm probably going to be going and, and start asking it, is uh, at Mozilla we run tests on Windows 7, Windows XP, Windows 8, 10.6, uh, 10.7, 10.8, 10 10 uh, uh, Ubuntu 12.04, Ubuntu 64 a bit. What is the right set of platforms that you actually need to be testing for your code to be good? For instance, um, I don't want to be disrespectful. Linux data uh, user base is not that large. Why do we still run 32-bit builds of uh, Ubuntu? Or um, some people say, oh, you've got to run many versions of Mac because we have many developers there. However, in that case, we should be running tests on Windows Vista because there's more users on Windows Vista than Mac users. So a way to analyze that and figure out what is useful and what is not. This is a question more for the practitioners, but uh, and specifically for Google. Uh, maybe you can start first. Help, help me, Google folks. You can be Google. Uh, what are you most proud about with your uh, build and release system now? If you had to point to one thing, like the thing that you feel like you do really well, or some tool, or some process, or some part of the system that is the the thing you're most proud of, or the thing you want to talk about the most, or the thing you want to see replicated in other other places. Actually, that actually that was really easy. And I, the thing I would have loved to have had is uh, 
we call them blaze and tap here, but it's basically the build system and the continuous integration system. Um, you know, 65 million, 65,000 lines of code of tests run per day are just amazing um, against every check-in that happens, pre-check-in, post-check-in. So, and it's it's at scale. That's the, yeah. I can, I can, I, my memory doesn't serve me. I can pull up the stats, but it's, that's what's amazing here. And, and, and so being so new and coming in and hear, hearing about it from the outside, but seeing it in practice, yeah, there's warts, there's, it's not, nothing's perfect, but it's just amazing. And you'll, you'll open source that soon, right? <laughs> uh, I'm going to take the fifth on that one. <laughs> If I had to think of anything, I'd say it's in the context of open source. I've done release engineering in a lot of non-open source companies, and Mozilla and Hortonworks are the two that I've been in that are open source. I think it's very interesting to show a couple of things. One, that you can have s open source does not mean half-baked or amateur. It can actually mean state-of-the-art, and proving that, and proving that in a way that's profitable and that actually attracts attention, also shows the way, like, hey, if you do it this way, it can actually make your life better. So the Mozilla was pretty cool for that. Uh, Hortonworks is also very cool for that. And, and they're non-trivial engineering problems. You get closed source companies have something simple, like you know the permission of all the people who connect into your system. You know, what if it's someone you've never met before? Are they really a good person trying to give you a patch, or are they some evil person trying to do something nefarious? And how do you know what to do there? So I think those are really complex problems and kind of cool. That's mine. There's something I want to add since I'm a Googler and I can answer Jack's question. I, one thing that, you know, like maybe too late for, you know, like the bigger companies, but there's going to be people watching here who are, you know, like in startups, there's a lot of economic activity right now taking, you know, like starting up in Silicon Valley, in the East Coast, Texas, you name it, Europe. Uh, you probably want to start thinking about open sourcing things and using open source, meaning, I guess, interacting with open source from the get go of the company. Yes, because yes. if you start building your own tools with an open source standard in mind and, you know, like not throwing stupid comments in the in the code, which really like your, your manager in five years will come and tell you, hey, we should open source this. And then, you oh, yes, but then we need to rewrite this and, you know, like maybe make it nicer. So if you if you actually adhere to open source standards from the beginning, it will make that transition easier. When you make that transition, when you open a tool, you know, like to the open source community, you will get, you know, like, you know, I mean, you guys have opened some of your stuff you get, you know, like immediate response, you know, like you get bug fixes, you get, you know, like new features for free. I mean, we're getting the same, you know, like on Android, you know, like you're probably seeing the same thing and others uh, in the room will be doing the same. So, so, you know, like the takeaway would be, you know, like if you're a company that is starting, don't make the mistake that Google made, that, you know, like we built, you know, like an incredibly scalable infrastructure, but also incredibly, uh, baroque, so to speak, and you know, like there's a lot of fixing going on right now. So don't make that mistake. Start, you know, like open source minded from the get go. Uh, I'm gonna, I'll answer it too. Just uh, so in my PhD, I looked at uh, peer review in, in open source projects, and so I interviewed a lot of uh, Linux developers, and they use almost no automated tests, but they have a really, really strong peer review process. So. Um, like their commit logs are massive. Like it describes exactly why everything is changing, which machines it's been, like who else has tried it, you know, all these other things. And Linus Torvalds will come along and say, you know, it's not that this, you know, feature isn't good. It's just that not enough people have talked about it. So, um, I mean, it's, it's hard to test the kernel, I think, is one of the reasons. But you can get sort of similar results by having this, this, this sort of trust, this, this triangle of trust where you really review everything very tightly. And I think that kind of ties into your karma thing, too. I mean, the pyramid of trust with like Linus and then the lieutenants and so on, it, it, it also sort of in, encourages um, good quality code. A few people have talked about uh, we have like automation and tools where developers can go ahead and like push things to production. So I've been coming, like I work for Twitter and there is a culture where like 
for PCI compliancy, like developers should not have access to production boxes and things like that. So I wanted to get your thoughts on like how like what a release engineer should like what's the role of a release engineer when developers just have access to like production boxes. This gets in a tricky area because SaaS and SOX compliance and there's all sorts of things. What I understand from it, and you can't take this as coming from anyone who, not a lawyer, um, the way we deal with it is through uh, rigorous auditing and logging. So like the Netflix model where you're all given the keys to the kingdom and can go about your business is great, but it, in my experience, it is it has pacified the auditors if when they come in, we show them exactly how we log, how the code gets in, all the all the things and the, the hooks in place, and the hooks are all secured. Um, we can log every path of everything that went in. We can log who touched what production machine. So the access is all there, but it is strictly logged, and the logging is scrutinized and locked down. We actually did, and we publicized this, we did a, uh, a red team event, our security infrastructure team, did a red team event against us uh, that I was part of. And what that means is we actively got gray hat people uh, in a secure building in our campus who through proxies through China attacked our infrastructure um, by tricking a developer to click on a, a link in a mail, which gave them access to, to a box. And they did this under our guy, under, you know, under our gaze while we watched them do this. And we were able to basically see, did our stuff work? Where did it fall down? Where did the, the gray hat get through? Um, and after that, we did the full audit and understood where we had to harden things up. Um, so that's the extent to which we, you know, we care about this and we, we tested it, which not a lot of companies would have the cojones to do. <laughs> it's kind of actually kind of scary to watch some guy go through China proxies to penetrate your whole system, um, which was interesting. To take the Mozilla example, the, the scenario we were concerned about there was that we didn't want a developer, there's the nefarious activity was one thing. The other possibility would be somebody who's just trying to make things better by installing their locally modified version of a compiler because it does a slightly better optimizing or it's a new version or it's a beta version of the next compiler or something. And then we would accidentally use that in production to ship a, a production release out. That was actually an operational concern we had because we had cleaned up a mess from that. Um, so what we did was we said, okay, lockdown access was part of how we dealt with the security part. And also if somebody actually wanted to get one of those machines, we had a way to route that you could get access to that machine. And then when you were finished with it, we would reset like total reformat because it was a human free re-image back into production job. Um, slightly different use case. I mean, I don't have an answer, but I just want to uh, clarify uh, something we, we get a bit confused. I mean, today we talk a lot about the engineering being helping the developers. Mm -hmm. So so the operation, the operators, uh, well, what's sort of the relationship um, uh, in all this? I mean, we, we heard about uh, configuration management and uh, release uh, engineering is, is kind of have interesting interactions. Um, but uh, what, what do release engineers say um, operators? Uh, the operation guy, the traditional IT operators. Uh, what, what's the role in all, all this? I, th I think there's a lot of overlap. Um, you, know, the, you know, this DevOps is a popular term these days. Everything from what the developer is doing through to an operations person and everything in between. I think you can change the label on the front, but the actual nature of the work in terms of understanding one population, figuring out how to figure, figure out how to build a pipeline and then figure out this other operational side and be able to communicate between these different groups, um, I think is what we would call release engineering, but um, that's not a great answer, but yeah. it's the best I have. Yes, it seems, I just feel when we go to uh, operators or some of the DevOps uh, meet, meetups with a lot of operators in it, the culture there is quite different from developers. Uh, they were among, um, Experience sharing, uh, you know, uh, level up uh, like kung fu masters, uh, <laughs> and they, they automate themselves out of the job. But on the other hand, uh, this seems consider human judgment, you know, experience is really much more important than tools. And uh, yeah, I mean, just um, yeah, observation. I think. Um, my name is Greg from Wikimedia Foundation. Um, back to the open source thing, obviously, because we're 
one of the largest sites that is completely open source. I think I can count the number of packages that we run in production that aren't open source on, I think, three fingers even. I think it's less than a hand. Like, I think it's three things, max mine database being one of them even. So anyways, um, for us, we have a large community of contributors um, contributing to our core product, right? Like MediaWiki software that powers all of our sites, um, which is a slightly different than some other use cases, more similar to, I guess I can't point to you anymore, to your use case of <laughs> um, uh, Firefox, right? You have open source contributors there. Uh, what have you learned and what changes at that kind of scale um, do you make when you want to do fast iterative uh, development and deployment um, when you have a larger community than just people you pay in-house, right? Um, what are the concerns and trade-offs that you have made throughout the years um, in that respect? Uh, the short question, uh, rephrase the question was, um, how do you, what kind of operational concerns are there? What kind of operational changes do you have to make if some of the people who are going to be making code changes are not on your employee. Right, basically, yeah. That, and how does that, yeah. And, yeah. and then what? Right. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah, there is, uh, there's a trust, actually, trust or karma, if you want to use the karma word. Um, uh, at least all the open source projects I've been involved with, uh, you have, um, you can make a proposal for a change, but you can't just come along and, and start making I know how to rewrite a kernel. Come on, get out of the way. Let me do it. You know, you don't do that. You can propose a, a patch in a bug, and you have someone else who's been around for a while and has built a reputation. So you have that trust hierarchy. So the initial person who comes along out of the blue does not have commit privileges. And you earn those stripes over time. And once you actually have enough commit privilege stripes earned, then you could actually do reviews of someone else and land those. But you know, they have other super reviewer, super stripes, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's one human process. And that is enforced for employees as well as non-employees equally. Um, two is it does totally change around how you handle, like where do you put your source code repository? Do you lock it behind VPN or do you put it out in the public? But how do you trust it if it's accessible from the outside? And so there's some just, there's some things that would make a lot of closed source companies nervous in terms of where you place critical machinery. Um, and then you have to be super precise and careful with those machines because you care about them, right? So where is your bug database accessible? What do you mean it's accessible from the outside world? Where is your, your source code repository? What do you mean it's accessible? So there's things like that you have to do that are probably unnatural for a closed source company. Um, and so you have to be super safe. Uh, those are the kind of operational tooling things. I think the human culture thing about reviews, I would recommend, even if you're not in an open source environment, you should have other people look at your code. People make typos, right? And you'd be amazed the amount of companies I've worked at that didn't have that. Because they just, well, we all know what we're doing. We never make mistakes. So. Um, ish. I mean, it's, it's a hard question, right? Because like, we also have the dual. So my title is, my title is release manager, which kind of confuses people. Um, because I deal mostly with the deployments. And we also have the release of MediaWiki, the software, the tarballs every six months, which I don't really care about because I don't run those things. I run the stuff that gets updated every week, right? Um, so there's competing interests there with developers that are wanting to maintain, God forbid, an Oracle database backend um, that, again, I don't give a, anything care about. But so, but how does that affect like our QA and testing and beta cluster and all that kind of stuff, right? Um, so it's just. I don't know if there's any other organizations that have this similar type of pullings going on with you know, a tarball that goes out to third parties and then the same code goes out to production and, and that kind of stuff, right? Yeah, I mean, uh, Mozilla would ship out to same source change set, would go to desktop browsers, would go to separate build Android browser, separate build to handset Firefox OS. Uh, Hortonworks is doing a similar sort of thing in terms of taking in code changes and delivering them to different places too. So yeah. it's tricky. It's where yeah. engineering, <laughs> release engineering is a tricky, fun thing. I'm wondering, um, we've heard a lot about the different roles that release engineering plays in uh, projects and teams and so on. I'm wondering where you think 
so the practitioners in the group, where you think release engineering provides the most value to an organization? Is it in tooling? Is it in the whole pipeline? You know, in my view, it's the, uh, the word I like is, is the adult supervision, right? Um, in that you have, if you're in the management of a company, you want to have some belief that there's somebody or something between, you know, the chaos that is your development environment and the poor suckers who are going to get your, your product, right? Uh, so I think the value that I've provided in the, the many release engineering jobs I've had out here in the Valley is that that management team or that executive, that CEO knows that, okay, there's that grumpy little guy called Chucker who's going to, you know, manage this for me and things aren't going to go wrong. Or if they are, we're going to be able to fix it and react and get better. So I think the fact that, you know, we sit at this critical junction of the chaos of development and the, the gold standard that your, your customers expect, it all comes through us. So that's always been my pitch to, you know, when I'm pitching to come at a company or trying to get a job, that's the value proposition. And I must, I have to actually say that when I went to, uh, from Google to Facebook, Facebook didn't have my position there. There was no release engineer in the job site. And I went, this is 2008. And uh, I just looked for some random engineering job and I just submitted my resume attached to it saying, listen, I'm not applying for this job, but this is what I do. And I kind of had to make that value. But they didn't know squat. These dummies came from college that had never had a job in their life, right? Um, so don't, this is not recording. Oh, shoot. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, so I had to make the proposition that, that, listen, this is what I do. This is why you need it. And this is what I will protect you from. And just give me these problems and I'll solve them. And if it doesn't work right, we'll fix it. Um, so that was the, the big value part that, uh, that I found. Uh, for the Wikimedia Foundation, um, so we're the prototypical, we started out as a prototypical cowboy types place, right? Like it was, it is what you think it is in a way. Like it was a completely open organization that, you know, anyone could do anything. And we had sysadmins that had access, um, but it was uncontrolled in a very a lot of ways. Um, and over the years, we've, we've started to get a little bit more, uh, I guess, grown up or uh, methodical about our processes and the growth of our release team quasi call it that even um is even just a virtual team in itself like it's not just one like the people on the release team are not just doing release all the time they're splitting their time between other things as well we're still at that size where that's the world we live in um and but it, but still with that amount of time we do have we've brought sanity and and more uh infrastructure to to our ability to do things so you can go from a you know a roughshod kind of place to a place that pushes code every week with, with basically the same release process as Facebook, um, with the weekly and then backports, um, and it it works really well for us. And it it wouldn't be possible with the amount of three and a half people that we have working on it. So, yeah, so usually, like uh, how I would define it is like we usually manage chaos in the company, like. Uh, Everyone relies on us like to like deploy every day and like it makes sure our site doesn't get like the no fail whales, no robots on twitter.com. So like usually it's mostly people rely on us and it's just like building trust with them most of the time with all our product managers or like our VPs and stuff like that to like maintain a pretty heavy schedule like doing deploys all the time and then making sure we don't break the site. When I'm going to be teaching a release engineering course or just even a lecture in one of the classes. Uh, one concept that I should be teaching them and one tool. What would you like to see? So one of the concepts would be like faster deploys. Like it could be through, we use something called uh, murder, which is a bit torrent protocol to deploy faster. But that could be like, there could be some other better ways to do faster deploys. John, uh, one thing I want you to to get in their heads would be some way to get that operational awareness. Some, I'm trying to think of a, of a good way to do it, but you know, we could talk or we could think about it, but some way to tell them that they're not divorced from the process of getting stuff out. When I came up through computer science in the 80s and 90s, worked out here, and as computer scientists, we did not dirty our hands with dealing with getting stuff out the door. You threw it over the wall and you went on with your life. 
Um, so something in a, in a setting that says, listen, your, your responsibility, your job as a computer scientist doesn't end when you commit to master and walk away. Um, so some way you can kind of tell them to, to, you know, it's on you to get it out uh, all the way. And, and a tool? A tool is, uh, you know, obviously we were all uh, kind of, as we used to be called build guys, a uh, good build tool. I like Buck, uh, which we've done, um, BuildBot. Just get familiar with the configuration files and the hooks and the expandability of a good build tool that takes, you know, that gives you the framework to start building the scaffolding for this so you can do it painlessly. Um, I think for, from my perspective, it's getting the, the like real world example use cases of the full process, right? From, from master to user of in you know it's a web or mobile or whatever right like there's a big gap there right and and it's not a chasm that you can throw things over um and what those pieces are and what the best practices of each step is right so sorry just do you have are there publicly available pro i guess you have talks there's publicly available process documents that we could kind of distill because i like doing case studies because it doesn't put the students to sleep so this is i think an excellent idea where you yeah. like go through the facebook or the I can show wikimedia you yeah it would be great to have those case studies because then they're like oh facebook or yeah. wikimedia they can tie it down instead of general <laughs> concepts yeah you have them as well right and and great thanks the, uh, the pitch I gave last year at this was, if you want to see any little bit of what we do, it's there in Puppet on our repo. It's public. Okay. Everything is there except for our password. I mean, that's your ultimate. I mean, w the Wikipedia guys are the ultimate example of how you can how you can do that. Uh, we're probably at close seconds because we are ridiculous with the amount of stuff that we just, like all the stuff I told you today and my other talk about front end are really, they're essentially the, the onboardings I give to people when they start at Facebook. You're getting the same information. Okay. Um, so those are two really great uh, examples. I think one thing is just a coding assignment. If you could have coding assignments to give out to people as they're learning to program, and then your next coding assignment, you know, like, oh, you build on, first it's a binary tree, now it's a B tree, or whatever kind of thing, right? Make it that the second coding assignment is to take someone else's code that was checked in somewhere, and that what they hand to you is a check-in URL. So that they learn how to do checkouts and check-ins, and they learn the cost of someone having written cruddy code, I think is one kind of awareness thing, as opposed to just writing into master and running away. I think the other thing is that for release engineers particularly, it's useful to have different skills. There's the coding and engineering stuff, but there's this sort of sysadmin machine networking mindset. And there's the human uh, diplomacy communication skill of being able to talk to product management, sysadmins, IT security guys, developers, VP of Eng, you know, all these, be able to communicate. So if there was some way to say that you would send people into a communications class, <laughs> or send them, like, go require them to attend some other classes that are non-engineering, to learn to talk to non-engineers more. Uh, speaking of this, I think that would be very helpful. That's my yeah, um, um, one, of the, one of the courses, uh, basically the architecture course, I get them to go and find a very small open source project and contribute to it, extract the architecture. And actually, first I get them to draw what they think the architecture is going to look like, and then they get to get them to extract it. And they're like, whoa, this is not, it's just a mess. Exactly. So yeah, no, it's, I think it's really valuable. And, and just yeah, adding that release engineering aspect to it. The, there's not many small open source projects that have testing. So I get them to do a refactoring. And I'm like, there should be a test, but <laughs> there isn't. So Anyways, great. thanks. OK, uh, great. That was, I, that was a great question. And I think I want to thank our, our, all of our panelists that we had. We're going to move on real quick and close out with another discussion.